Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So, um, did you guys notice my hair today? <laughs> yeah, it's very special. Are you going to ask me why? Yes, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, tomorrow is a very big day, and um, we are recording this on November 11th. And November 12th is a very exciting day for me for two reasons. The first is that my youngest kid comes home from New Zealand and I haven't seen him in four months, and I'm ridiculously excited to go pick him up at the airport tomorrow. And the second reason is that tomorrow, November 12th, is publication of our book, Dreamwise. Ta -da. So I was trying to kind of tone match the cover, color of the cover of the book. I don't... A good attempt. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it really worked, but whether or not my hair works, I really believe that this book works. So I hope if you haven't purchased your copy, you will run out and do it right now. So today we're going to be talking about self-betrayal. Uh, how do we abandon ourselves? How do we uh, cheat ourselves? The different ways that this can happen. And how does this show up in dreams and fairy tales? So, and, and it's a kind of heartbreaking thing when it happens, when we realize that we've betrayed ourselves. So we're going to be walking around that issue today. I wonder if we could first circle around the difference between self-betrayal and self-sabotage. So we've talked about self-sabotage. And listeners might be thinking, isn't this more or less the same thing? But it isn't. Well, it depends on if you're a lumper or a splitter. <laughs> and I am personally a little bit more of a splitter. I think that self-sabotage, they're obviously related, right? Because sometimes when we sabotage ourselves, that is a form of self-betrayal. But self-sabotage is really about sort of getting in our own way. And self-betrayal is really, it's, it's something even darker, I think. And, and by the way, I think we probably betray ourselves every single day, multiple times per day. So it's not unusual. But, but it is a darker phenomenon where, where we, gosh, what just jumped into my mind actually was, let's get right to it, the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. when, when Christ is betrayed, uh, is it three times? I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't look it up. But, you know, he says, stay awake with me. And we all. This is to Peter. This isn't Judas, but to Peter. Mm -hmm. Right. So Christ says, uh, right. Well, th there's several betrayals going on. But the, but the one I was thinking of is this to Peter, stay awake. And Peter's like, oh, absolutely. And, and then falls asleep. And that, that, is, that is the kind of betrayal that we, we do every single day where we, we have an aspiration, we have something that feels important to us. I think it has, you know, Joseph, when we were prepping this, you mentioned this issue about values. And I think self-betrayal is probably very linked to values. Something matters to us and we don't do right by it. So we want to stay awake in that garden and then we fall asleep. We don't want to spend all day scrolling on our phones. We want to read a book instead, but damn it, there it is at the end of the day and we're doom scrolling or, or whatever it is. So it's where we, you know, and Joseph, again, these were your words, but I think they really capture something. We, we abandon something that matters to us. And I was thinking as we were preparing, looking at the word betray, because it's a very specific descriptor of this psychological state. And it comes from the Latin tradere, which mean, means to be handed over to, mm. to be given <laughs> across to something yeah. else. So it's as if we have a value of using my time very efficiently. 
but then I am like abducted or handed over yes. to something else. Yep. And I find myself scrolling for four hours and then being a half hour late for work. Mm-hmm. So, so how do we understand it that? And the self-betraying moment is also that gas when we're, we've gotten out of the hand of whatever we've been handed over to. And then we're like, oh my God, what was I just, what did I do? So there's that element of kind of painful surprise. I also think it is an abrogation or a violation of, of a standard expectation or norm, uh, such as Hansel and Gretel. The expectation and the norm is that families live together and children get taken care of to the best of the parent's ability. They don't get dumped in the woods at night because uh, parents feel uh, it's too much for them at this point. When there's an issue of infidelity in a bonded couple, but wait a minute, that's not supposed to happen versus being led down the old garden path that happens to all of us of, uh uh-oh, I spent too much time again on social media or watching TV. And I didn't read the book I thought I was going to spend time with. But that, if there's that element of having been done to rather than doing it to ourselves. And then also the sort of the surprise and shock of it. I can't believe he did this to me. It's the difference between like being betrayed by someone else versus the self-betrayal. What were you going to say, Joseph? That when we're betrayed by something else or someone else, then we can point across the room Mm -hmm. and put blame on someone else. You did this to me, which exonerates us. With self-betrayal, there is that same feeling, Deb. You know, like I've turned my own inner children out into the woods to, you know, fend for themselves. And there's nowhere else to point but to myself. And that is an interesting inversion of the finger. Of yeah. the pointing finger. That's exactly part of the self-betrayal that w- I'm wanting to lift up. That from a Jungian point of view in a fairy tale, all the characters are representing mm-hmm. parts of the psyche. So, But this is often how we feel with self-betrayal of uh, he or she or they did it to me versus what was my part in it. Right. How did I contribute to this? And often in fairy tales, um, I think the theme is an underlying either ignorance or innocence Mm -hmm. that something that, you know, Hansel and Gretel didn't know any better. Snow White didn't know any better. And so it goes. But what part of that is you that didn't notice, uh, didn't know, and so it feels like being done to? You're pu- you don't agree, Joseph. You just yeah. No, I'm I'm putting it in the hopper, moving it around. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's me shaking it around in my head. Yeah, there, there's also the way that um, when someone does something to us, how we respond, we can either you know stand up for ourselves, or or sometimes we sort of capitulate, right? And there are those times where, where that's a self-betrayal. I mean, I'm thinking about, and I I wrote about this in um, the Vital Spark. This woman that I worked with who had just been um, really trying to, you know, go along to get along or get along to go along with her husband for years. You know, they had kids and she was just trying to do the right thing and trying not to, you know, she was kind of conflict averse and she didn't want to make waves. And, uh, you know, by, by the time two decades of married life rolled around, she'd realized that she'd been very complicit in a massive self betrayal because she had never stood her ground on some things that really mattered to her. And and so that was a self-betrayal first and foremost, but it also was a betrayal of the relationship because you can't expect for a relationship to be healthy and to grow when you're not able to show up for yourself in it. Gosh, I I just think that's huge, actually, that we don't show up for ourselves. 
And there are all kinds of, quote, good reasons, unquote, for that. That that's okay. I can let this go. That's okay. I can overlook it. Oh, it it really matters to the other person. Or, you know, my colleague so and so has been with a company much longer than I have. That is the person that deserves the the raise or the promotion. Mm -hmm. We don't show up for ourselves. And that takes me to one possible ingredient in this is our fear of conflict. Of don't rock the boat and the fear that there will be a severe repercussions if we do that, uh, that people will say, well, then, okay, you're fired. Why don't you just go get another job then if you don't like it here? Um, same thing in relationships, neighborhoods, committees, the list goes on and on. I think underneath it is the fear of being exiled. I mean, I think that's part of it, but I, but yeah. I also, I also think though that it can be lots of things. Like going back to Peter falling asleep, it's almost like we have trouble sort of staying vigilant, sort of staying connected with ourselves. I'm, it's making me think of pretty much one of my favorite Jim Hollis quotes, which is he says in Mythologems, he says, "We all have an appointment with ourselves, and most of us never show up for it." <laughs> And I just love that. And I think that that's, that that's true. Again, it's true in little daily ways. And it's true in big lifelong ways, too. And hopefully, hopefully we show up at least some of the time. We're never going to show up all of the time because we're fallible. So again, we fall asleep even when we said, no, 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 I, this matters so much. I'm going to stay awake. But then we don't. And I think the, the word betrayal lends a certain kind of intensity to the realization that we've done that. So in order to experience self-betrayal, we have to have that moment that we have participated in this outcome, that we have abandoned our own values or abandoned our needs, as you had said about the marriage, or abandoned our truths. Yeah. Which also suggests that you actually know what your values are, you know what your needs are, and you know what your truths are. So it may be that it's quite uh, a long time later that you have that experience of self-betrayal, just as you were using the example of this woman from The Vital Spark. It was really long into it that she identified consciously what her values or needs were and then realized that she had been betraying herself over and again. So one of the things you're raising is that self-betrayal usually happens unconsciously. Quite so. We're not even aware we're doing it. And there is a a rupture at that point, and we have this sense of, of alienation from, at the very least, the image of who we believed ourselves to be. And perhaps if we do know ourselves well, then we're alienated from even a deeper level, which frankly, I I think can lead to a growth period because self-betrayal, I think, pulls us into kind of a self-inquiry. It makes us quiet and draws us inward. It makes us sober about the thing. If you've been thinking about joining Dream School, now is the time. We're offering 10% off until December 31st. Dream School is a unique online course that offers you access to the inner world of knowing, possibility, and imagination. Presented by the three of us, this year-long program provides the space, knowledge, and guidance that lets you reach within and access the secrets of the inner self that appears each night in your dreams. It's an affirming community of fellow travelers, each on an individual inner adventure. Join us in an adventure to wholeness through understanding your dreams, the little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of soul. You know, I'm thinking this might be a good time to ground this in uh, some examples. Yeah. And I'm starting with the example you offered of Gethsemane and Peter's betrayal of Jesus and the relationship between self-betrayal and ambivalence Hmm. of that part of me is loyal to something. Yeah. 
but part of me is not. Part of me is scared of it. Part of me doesn't know if I can do it. Part of me is very leery of the cost. I like if I really stick up for this part of myself, you know, what if my life as I know it uh, crumbles? So of honoring uh, those parts of ourselves, of, you know, of those mixed emotions that we have toward all kinds of things. And that, that's not the problem. The problem isn't that we have mixed feelings. The problem is that we can't uh, surface all those mixed feelings into consciousness and go, oh my gosh, you know, what if I do stay up all night for this guy? Uh, what's likely to happen to me? Well, that's pretty scary. Okay, now what? We just sort of take our little airbrush and go, whew, and we go to sleep. In some way, go unconscious, getting rid of the ambivalence and our need to face it. Deb, I think that's really great. I think I think it's a wonderful distinction to get into. And and also, I love that you raised, uh, what is the cost? Because I think that's probably the thing, you know, what's the cost of showing up to that appointment with ourselves? Well, it might be scary. It might actually ask a lot of us. I mean, what if I ask myself what I want? If I really admit that to myself, I might have to, I might have to work hard, let's say. What if I admit to myself that um, there's some things about my marriage I'm, I really don't love? Then I might have to know that, which is pretty uncomfortable. And then I might have to do something about it. So I think that there's all kinds of ways where we just, we don't want to have to pay the cost of uh, remaining true to the, the feelings, the values, the, the attitudes. Um, and, and, then, and then as you say, ambivalence enters the picture. So we might wonder if it isn't uh, when we don't manage our ambivalence well, that's when we betray ourselves. And often I think that we're not even aware that we're ambivalent until it trips us up in some way, until there is a cost. Right. Because we can be quietly ambivalent and then just shunt aside decisions or actions because we can't find a place to stand that allows us to take action. But I think in the examples, that we had given, the idea of, of Peter falling asleep, or all of them falling asleep, is this idea of lethargy, and that lethargy can be something that invades us, and then we find that we're, just as you were saying, Lisa, we're not showing up for the appointment. And the other is fear. And when I think about in the Gethsemane experience that Christ is denied, I mean, that's fear driven, that there's a repercussion for you to declare your alignment with a value or a person or a political movement or a religious belief. And that in the face of certain fear, that we will pretend that we are someone else or we don't actually have that value. I also want to say that one can make an argument for that being adaptive. But for some of us, Later on in that dark night when we are alone, for some of us that feels like a betrayal that we have been treacherous to whatever we believe our values are. I think also you were saying, Lisa, about the woman who is ambivalent about leaving the marriage and, and just insecurity, that I do not feel secure in my own capacity to create my own capacity to make change and to create something new, that to have those internal resources. And Deb, you were saying earlier something about the need for external validation, that it takes a lot of energy to individuate from the culture that we're in. And so we will betray, again, our true desires, our true needs in exchange for that you know, bag of silver, so to speak which is whatever the, the approving smile from the community around us. I'm going back to our idea of how unconscious self-betrayal is, which makes it, as you said before, Lisa, darker uh, than self-sabotage, because I know I should turn off the TV and read my great book, whatever it might be. That's in my awareness. And self-betrayal is often not as 
with the story of Peter who falls asleep. And that that's a theme in fairy tales of people forget the time, they fall asleep at the very last minute, and goes to what you were talking about, Joseph, of the lethargy, of that there is some way inside ourselves that we make this unimportant, or we let it sink below the surface of awareness. And that's the key element for me in uh, self-betrayal is that we erase it from consciousness, where, of course, it will simmer along underground. Anyway, it's not as if we've gotten rid of it. But that's the part that makes it a little darker. Is It's hard to lift it up. Exactly. And so we can be betraying ourselves and not know it, in which case we're, we don't catch it until something has brought it into our face in a given moment. But I'm going to try to just differentiate between the three things, ambivalence, self-defeating behaviors, and self-betrayal. That ambivalence is an internal conflict between opposing desires or values. And that indicates more about psychological tension, but not necessarily self-rejection. Self-defeating behaviors, I think, are repetitive, maladaptive patterns. And that's often due to unconscious fears, or perhaps, uh, Freud would say, trying to master some kind of destructive situation. And that's more symptomatic rather than indicative of a betrayal. So I think what's unique to self-betrayal is that there is a suppression of an inner truth in exchange for something else. And it may be that something other than the ego suppresses the inner truth because we are a multiplicity. But I think there's something about the Gethsemane betrayal mm -hmm. that a suppression of inner truth for some kind of a payoff, which often is external acceptance, but not always. And I think the difference there is that with self-betrayal, there is it leads to a feeling of fragmentation, internal fragmentation, and being alienated from something inside of ourselves, being cast out. So I really I like that. I I also think it's kind of cool what we're doing because we're doing like you know those those middle middle medieval scholastic scholars who tried to figure out like how many angels can dance on head of a pen kind 46. of thing. You know, it's like yeah. <laughs> I thought I was 43. But anyway, Joseph, I like what you're saying about ambivalence is like tension. And actually, um, self-sabotage really speaks to some symptoms, which I think is true. And what I think about self-sabotage is it's kind of, um, it keeps us from maybe like out adapting perhaps or achieving. Mm -hmm. But self-betrayal to me seems more fundamental because it is um, the betrayal or the abandonment of something really essential. Right. So self sabotage might be, uh, I don't know, we, we, we never, we, we never get the tidy house we want or something like that because we keep on engaging in maladaptive behaviors. But self betrayal feels it touches more our essential nature and means we have been untrue to it somehow. So there's something about the inevitability of it that we're all going to betray ourselves at some point. I think. We can feel that our body betrays us as we start to age. That's often a very profound feeling. Um, we, can, we can feel betrayed by our psyche because the ego has a particular agenda that it wants and then the self doesn't line up behind it. And, you know, it's like we want to shake our fist at the, at the universe. Um, but it, it really does take courage to show up for that appointment, doesn't it? I think so, because there is there's a cost. There is something fundamental, as you said, inside of us that is just true. And it could be I truly need something or I truly believe in something. And that just in the way that one betrays a spouse, that we are betraying something that is supposed to be precious to us. And yes. then we act in ways that are destructive towards the thing that we believed was so important, so precious, such an object of veneration you know inside what? of us. That word is really helpful to me as I think about this precious, because 
self betrayal implies that we have we have damaged, we've abandoned, we've betrayed something precious. I think that's you know, which which kind of goes back to what you were saying, Deb, about about like Hansel and Gretel. It's like the most precious thing, a child. And then we I remember one of our teachers years ago, like and when we were first in training, it may have been it may have been Hollis, who said we all kill our children every day. And I thought, wow, you know, I think we were maybe we were talking about Medea or something who um, you know, kills her children. But whoever it was, the analyst said, we all kill our children every day. And I thought, oh, my God, we do. So there are these, these little ways that we, that we don't show. I mean, sometimes you have to kill your children. There are, there are children that you have to kill. You know, like you have a, you ha- I'm thinking you have an idea, but you just don't have the energy or the time to do it. You just have to let that die. But I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about like you wake up in the morning and, and you want to you're you're making a point to sort of, sort of cultivate spirituality and so you have this intention as you move through the day and you're going to engage in prayer or meditation or something and then you don't do it again that's a little self betrayal you just killed a child you know so yeah that idea of something precious i'm going back to what you said just a little while ago about our ego desires and our ego values, and the unconscious psyche, the collective unconscious, the mythological layer that we all have, that that is very hard often to really allow to bubble up. That if the status quo is okay, and there is some part of of a person uh, that wants to go on a big trip or go back to school or change careers. I say, ah, I can't change careers. Um, you know, we have a mortgage to pay and kids take piano lessons and uh, all the rest of it. Um, I can't do that. That that's the part that tends to just get erased because that is a desire that is not in alignment with ego. We can rationalize it and say, well, that's very self-centered. Uh, versus paying attention to the call from within uh, to do something else that is more true to one's own nature. And it doesn't mean that then you you say, well, you know, throw everything to the wind. Uh, We're selling the house and I'm I'm changing career. But it does mean we acknowledge that something is bubbling within us that will shake up the status quo. It's threatening. It will really shake up the status quo much more than my, once again, failing to meditate in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we betray ourselves in terms of getting our unconscious wishes in alignment with ego rather than just trying to suppress them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, and that's an important distinction because the ego can feel very potent and godlike and make all kinds of New Year's resolutions <laughs> yep. that might be very <laughs> thoughtful and quite possible, but they also can be destructively driven by some kind of cultural value. Yep. So the ego can, can entertain all kinds of things and then find that it doesn't have enough inner support to do things. But I think the betrayal has to do with a contract, as we said, the precious contract inside of us. It's something that is much more central Mm -hmm. and core to the personality. So I I liked what you said, Deb, about the way rationalization can make it easier to betray ourselves, because when we're betraying ourselves or when we're approaching a self-betraying opportunity, that we will often feel anxious and we won't kind of know what to do, and to defend against the anxiety, then we'll rationalize the betrayal. We'll create some kind of story in the back of our mind that justifies, oh, I'll just go along with, I'll stay in that job for another year, or, you know, I'll I'll do this or that. Because the dissonance between what you're married to in the deepest part of you, and just as you were saying, the cost of staying true to that, versus the other pressures around us creates so much anxiety. 
So we rationalize all kinds of things. I also think that um, we project as a way of escaping the truth of self-betrayal that instead of really feeling how the the truth inside of us is hurt, is hurting and is hurt by the fact that we didn't protect it, mm. that mm -hmm. we then mm -hmm. project it out into some other external thing. And so somebody else is, is a liar, or somebody else is a fraud or a faker, any number of different things, that the, the other person is the one who's, who's got the problem, but I don't really have the problem because the pain is so intense. You know, the pain and the hurt, what it, what it made me think of is, uh, I think, a common way that uh, self-betrayal might show up in dreams is people often have a dream of an animal or a child that they've been responsible for, right. that they needed to feed, and they come upon the animal or the child, and they realize that they left the child in the car, or they forgot to feed the bird, or the kitten is emaciated, they were supposed to be taking care of it. And then we realize, I mean, I think probably most of us have had this dream at least once. I know I have. And then it's like, oh my God, I was supposed to take care of this and I didn't. That's a real image of a, of a self-betrayal, that there's some part of us we, we're, we, that really needed our attention and we didn't give it to it. And of course, the dream kind of provides a corrective at that point. I want to take us in a slightly different direction and talk about um, maybe a more fundamental form of self-betrayal that's almost kind of baked into maybe our, our humanness, which is that the way that we, because merely because of the fact that we're moderns, we routinely betray the instincts. And Jung talked a lot about being cut off from the instincts, being cut off from the, what he called the two million year old man. And there's a way that this is that this is just our nature, and and I think that um, Ian McGilchrist, in his phenomenal book that, as you know, if you listen to the podcast, I love deeply, the Master and His Emissary. He, I think he's getting at something of the same thing that Jung is talking about. Um, I mean, this is a super kind of broad brush, but uh, I think we're in that same neighborhood. So I want to just read a little bit from uh, this book, uh, be, because. It relates to our topic. So this is at the end of McGilchrist's introduction. There is a story in Nietzsche that goes something like this. There was once a wise spiritual master who was the ruler of a small but prosperous domain and who was known for his selfless devotion to his people. As his people flourished and grew in number, the bounds of this small domain spread and with it the need to trust implicitly the emissaries he sent to ensure the safety of its ever more distant parts. It was not just that it was impossible for him personally to order all that needed to be dealt with, as he wisely saw he needed to keep his distance from and remain ignorant of such concerns. And so he nurtured and trained carefully his emissaries in order that they could be trusted. Eventually, however, his cleverest and most, most ambitious vizier, the one he trusted most to do his work, began to see himself as the master and used his position to advance his own wealth and influence. He saw his master's temperance and forbearance as weakness, not wisdom, and on his missions on the master's behalf adopted his mantle as his own. The emissary became contemptuous of his master, and so it came about that the master was usurped the people were duped, the domain became a tyranny, and eventually it collapsed into ruins. So how that relates to his thesis, he says, the master is our right brain, which is responsible for holistic thinking, implicit meaning, metaphor, embodiment, all kinds of other things. The emissary is our left brain, which is very good at chopping things up into parts being kind of instrumental in it in the way it sees the world and and that you know his point is that the 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 left brain way of looking at the world develops and becomes more elaborated over the course of human evolution in order to do the bidding of 
the more holistically oriented, I always get confused, right brain. But then eventually what, what has happened is that that part of us has grown so strong and is so good at what it does that it has really usurped that function. So uh, the emissary betrays the master in the Gilchrist thinking. And this is a great parallel, really, to the relationship between the ego and the unconscious. Right. Th- that the ego thinks it runs the show. Right. Um, and our... And we are ever more distant from instincts, just as we are, many of us, ever more distant from all kinds of natural processes, connection with nature, et cetera. And this is a good, smart, advanced, technologically proficient way to live, is what we think. I'm thinking how important it is to have that dialogue between those two parts of ourselves. Right. So when when we get divorced from this, this stuff of primary process thinking, dreams, imagination, visionary events, um, ritual, myth, fairy tales, um, metaphor, that, that these things are so primary to what it means to be human. And when we go through the world in a very left-brained way, as many of us do, well, I have to do this today. And, um, you know, I have my, my ordered list of priorities and I, I need to get things done. I'm just going to focus on, on this level of things. It is a kind of profound betrayal. And it is the nature of the human condition, as it were, also. And it's a developmental reality as well, that in the course of growing up, as we've talked about before, uh, we do have to learn to sort of suppress a lot of our instinctual uh, desires, urges, feelings uh, for the sake of developing a social and socially acceptable uh, way of interacting with people in the world. That You have to get up and you have to make your bed. You have to go to school. You have to raise your hand if you want to talk. Um, these are all things that help us develop ego strength. But then, like the emissary, the ego tends to think it's in charge of everything. It's my whole self versus a part that has been developed in service to the master of that more right-brained, holistic, metaphorically oriented part of ourselves. I think that fear of instincts that sometimes rolls around in the culture and in us as therapists is a kind of Freudian throwback. But I think that if we stay closer to Jung's idea of the instincts, sex, activity, creativity, self-reflection, religious or mythological imaginings, then all of a sudden we can understand that suppressing the instinctive level is cutting us off from much, much more than, let's say, sex and aggression. So the betrayal can be really substantive, like going into a career that you have absolutely no intrinsic relationship to, Mm -hmm. only because someone told you that you'd be able to do a good cost-benefit analysis between what you paid for your degree and how much money you can make in the external environment. Yes, that's adaptive, but there may be so many other important instincts to create and self-reflect that have been shunted aside or betrayed because you were supposed to love them, not you know something you read off the internet that told you you couldn't do a good cost-benefit analysis by becoming an English major. <laughs> you know, Deb, you, you brought up some fairy tales, and I'm just so aware of how many fairy tales feature images of betrayal. You know, there mm-hmm. are the, the appointments that that people are late for, that they don't show up for, that there's fairy tales where uh, the lovers don't remember one another, they don't recognize each other. There are fairy tales where the brothers, the older brothers take the youngest brother and, you know, stuff him in a closet so he can't go claim the bride or whatever it is. (laughs) There's just all kinds of things that happen. But when I was thinking about the topic today, I was thinking about a fairy tale motif that's very common. It's the type of fairy tale. There's a fairy tale typology, and these are 
These tales are known as the true bride and the false bride. And there are many, 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 many versions of them, which is interesting. But the one that I knew first when I was a child, and uh, that I think is probably most known to us, is the tale of the goose girl. And I think it, it, it's a fascinating example of, of self-betrayal. And, and I'd love it if we could talk about this fairy tale for a bit as an example of this psychological phenomenon. So I'm going to read it. I'm reading from my favorite version of Grimm's, which is the complete first edition of the Brothers Grimm. And I'll put that a link to that in the show notes. The Goose Girl. There was once an old queen whose husband had been dead for many years, and she had a beautiful daughter. When the daughter grew up, she was betrothed to a prince who lived far away. When the time came for her to be married, and the princess had to get ready to depart for the distant kingdom, the old queen packed up a great many precious items and ornaments, gold and silver, goblets and jewels, in short, everything that suited a royal dowry for she loved her child with all her heart. She also gave her a chambermaid who was to accompany her and deliver her safely into the hands of her bridegroom. Each received a horse for the journey, but the princess's horse was named Falada and could speak. When the hour of departure arrived, the old mother went into her bedroom, took a small knife, and cut her finger to make it bleed. Then she placed a white handkerchief beneath, underneath her finger, let three drops of blood fall on it, and gave it to her daughter. My dear child, she said, take good care of these three drops, for they will help you on your journey when you're in need. After they had bid each other a sad farewell, the princess stuck the handkerchief into her bosom, mounted her horse, and began her journey to her bridegroom. After riding an hour, she felt very thirsty and called to her chambermaid, Get down and fetch some water for me from the brook with my goblet that you brought along for me. I'd like to have something to drink. Hey, if you're thirsty, said the chambermaid, get down yourself and lie down by the water and drink. I don't like being your servant. Since the princess was very thirsty, she dismounted, bent over the brook, and drank some water but she was not allowed to drink out of the golden goblet. Oh God, she said. Then the three drops of blood replied, Ah, if your mother only knew, her heart would break in two. But the princess was quite humble. She said nothing and got back on her horse. They continued riding a few miles further. The day was warm and the sun so sticky and hot that she soon got thirsty again. When they came to a stream, she called to her chambermaid once more, Get down and bring me something to drink from my golden cup, for she had long since forgotten the servant's nasty words. If you want to drink, the chambermaid said even more haughtily than before, Drink by yourself. I don't like being your servant. Since she was very thirsty, the princess dismounted, lay down next to the running water, and wept. Oh God, she said. Once again, the drops of blood responded, Ah, if your mother only knew, her heart would break in two. As she was leaning over the bank and drinking the water, her handkerchief, the three drops of blood, fell out of her bosom and floated downstream without her ever noticing it. So great was her fear. But the chambermaid had seen it and was delighted because she knew that now she could have power over the princess. Without the three drops of blood, the princess had become weak. So, as she was about to get back on the horse named Falada, the chambermaid said, Falada belongs to me. Yours is the nag. The princess had to put up with all that. Moreover, the chambermaid ordered her to take off her royal garments and to put on the maid's shabby clothes. Finally, she had to swear under open skies that she would never tell a soul at the royal court what the chambermaid had done. If the princess hadn't given her word, she would have been killed on the spot. But Falada saw all of this and took good note of it. Now, the chambermaid mounted Falada, and the true bride had to get on the wretched nag. Thus, they continued their journey until they finally arrived at the royal castle. 
There was great rejoicing when they entered the courtyard, and the prince ran to meet them. He lifted the chambermaid from her horse, thinking she was his bride. Then he led her upstairs while the true princess was left standing below. Meanwhile, the old king peered out a window, and when he saw her standing in the courtyard, he was struck by her fine, delicate features. He went straight to the royal suite and asked the bride about the girl she had brought with her, the one standing below in the courtyard, and who she was. Oh, I picked her up along the way to keep me company. Just give her something to keep her busy. But the old king had no work for her and could only respond, I have a little boy who tends the geese. Perhaps she could help him. The boy's name was Little Conrad, and the true bride had to help him tend the geese. Shortly after, the false bride said to the young king, Dearest husband, I'd like you to do me a favor. I'd be glad to, he answered. Well then, let me summon the knacker. I want him to cut off the head of the horse that carried me here because it gave me nothing but trouble along the way. However, she was actually afraid the horse would reveal what she had done to the princess. When all the preparations had been made and faithful Falada was about to die, word reached the ears of the true princess and she secretly promised the knacker a gold coin if he would render her small service. There was a big, dark gateway through which she had to pass every morning and evening with the geese, and she wanted him to nail Falada's head on the wall under the dark gateway where she could always see it. The knacker promised to do it, and when he cut off the horse's head, he nailed it firmly onto the wall under the dark gateway. Early the next morning, when she and Conrad drove the geese out through the gateway, she said in passing, Oh, poor Falada, I see you hanging there. Then the head answered, Dear princess, is that really you there? Oh, if only your mother knew, her heart would break in two. She walked out of the city in silence, and they drove the geese into the fields. When she reached the meadow, she sat down and undid her hair, which was as pure as gold. Little Conrad liked the way her hair glistened so much that he tried to pull out a few strands. Then she said, Blow, wind, oh, blow with all your might. Blow little Conrad's cap out of sight. Make him chase it everywhere till I braided all my hair and fixed it so that it's all right. Then a gust of wind came and blew off little Conrad's cap into the fields, and he had to run after it. By the time he returned with it, she had finished combing and putting her hair up and couldn't get a single strand of it. Little Conrad became so angry that he wouldn't speak to her after that. Thus they tended the geese until evening when they set out on their way home. The next morning, when they drove the geese through the dark gateway, the maiden said, Oh, poor Falada, I see you hanging there. Then Falada responded, Dear princess, is that really you? Oh, if your mother knew, her heart would break in two. Once she was in the field again, she sat down in the meadow and began to comb out her hair. Little Conrad ran up and tried to grab it, but she quickly said, Blow, wind, oh, blow with all your might. Blow little Conrad's cap out of sight and make him chase it everywhere till I braided all my hair and fixed it so it's all right. The wind blew and whisked the cap off his head and drove it far off so that Conrad had to, run, had to run after it. When he came back, she had long since put up her hair and he couldn't get a single strand. Thus, they tended the geese until evening. However, upon returning that evening, little Conrad went to the old king and said, I don't want to tend the geese with that girl anymore. Why not? asked the king. Well, she torments me the whole day long. Immediately, the old king ordered him to tell him what she did, and Conrad said, In the morning, when we pass through the dark gateway, there's a horse's head on the wall, and she always says, Oh, poor Falada, I see you hanging there, and the head answers, Dear princess, is that really you there? Oh, if your mother knew, her heart would break in two. And thus little Conrad went on to tell the king what happened out on the meadow and how he had to run after his cap. The old king ordered him to drive the geese out again the next day, and when morning came, the old king hid himself behind the dark gateway and heard her speak to Falada's head. Then he followed her into the fields and hid behind some bushes in the meadow. Soon he saw with his own eyes how the goose girl and the goose boy led the geese to the meadow, and how she sat after a while and undid her hair that glistened radiantly. Before long, she said, Blow, window, blow with all your might. 
blow little Conrad's cap out of sight and make him chase it everywhere until I've braided all my hair and fixed it so it's all right. Then a gust of wind came and carried little Conrad's cap away so that he had to run far, and the maiden calmly combed and braided her hair. All this was observed by the old king. He then went home unnoticed, and when the goose girl came back that evening, he called her aside and asked her why she did all these things. I'm not allowed to tell you, nor am I allowed to bemoan my plight to anyone. Such is the oath I swore under open skies, otherwise I would have been killed. Although he kept on insisting and would give her no peace, she wouldn't talk. Then he said, If you don't want to tell me anything, then you certainly may let the iron stove over there listen to your sorrows. All right, said the maiden, I'll do that. Upon saying that, she crawled into the iron stove and poured her heart out and told it what had happened to her and how she had been betrayed by the wicked chambermaid. Now the oven had a hole on top, and the old king overheard what she said and listened to every word she uttered about her fate. He immediately intended to make everything good and had her dressed in royal garments, and it was like a miracle to see how beautiful she really was. The old king called his son and revealed to him that he had the wrong bride, who was nothing but a chambermaid. The true bride, however, was standing there before him, the former goose girl. The young king was delighted and ecstatic when he saw how beautiful and virtuous she was. Now a great feast was prepared and all their friends and the entire court were invited to attend. At the head of the table sat the bridegroom with the princess at one side and the chambermaid at the other. But the chambermaid was so distracted that she could no longer recognize the princess who was dressed in a dazzling manner. After they finished eating and drinking and were all in high spirits, the old king gave the chambermaid a riddle to solve. What punishment did a woman deserve who had deceived her lord in such and such a way? Whereupon he told her the whole story and concluded by asking, How would you sentence her? She deserves nothing better, said the false bride, than to be stripped completely naked and put inside a barrel studded with sharp nails. Then two white horses should be harnessed to the barrel and made to drag her through the streets until she's dead. You're the woman, said the old king, and you've pronounced your own sentence, and this shall happen to you. After the sentence had been carried out, the young king married his true bride, and they both reigned over their kingdom in peace and bliss. I have to say, right at the end, I'm always uh, astonished at the particularly gruesome punishments that fairy tales can come up with. Yes, indeed. It's a rough tale, right? I mean, I remember hearing it as a kid, and in fact, it was my sister's favorite. <gasps> it was. It was <gasps> her favorite. But a wonderful thing, fairy tales. They're, they're gruesome and wonderful. So let's weave that into self-betrayal. Yep. What were you thinking when you were uh, planning on reading it? So, you know, obviously, the true bride and the, and the false bride are two aspects of a single psyche, as Deb pointed out to us earlier. So the true bride is something like our, our true self, what really matters most to us. And the false bride is, is maybe a little bit like McGilchrist's emissary that can get carried away, that can get attracted to other values. Uh, you know, it's interesting that the chambermaid seems to not have any power over her at all until she leaves home. Mm. And so it might be, for example, just to make up a story that we could map this onto, that the princess who uh, has this very good mother, who is a, a source of kind of lifeblood to her, uh, you know, is, is, let's say, raised with a certain set of values, a certain knowing who she is, perhaps, or, or being, um, you know, having, having perhaps certain religious beliefs or, or, or a certain sense of, of what really matters most in the world. But when she goes off to college, <laughs> let's say, she becomes really entranced by, I'm going to make it up, maybe um, the world of the social life. And so instead of staying true to what she really cared about and really interested her her whole life, let's say, she I'm totally making this up, let's say she loved English literature, let's say she loved to read, 
and reading was her thing and it was her happy place. And it, and it really, really mattered to her to, to read and understand books. But she goes off to college and she starts drinking too much and maybe smoking too much weed and hang, you know, just, just sort of not, not really tending to those things that, she, that, that mattered to her. And then, and then it's like the true bride has been lost. And the part that goes off into the world every day is this other part of ourselves, maybe that, you know, is going to maybe dress the role of super fashionista or something. And, and really, that's not who we are. And, and so we can lose ourselves. We can lose touch with ourselves. And it can be a terrible, a terrible betrayal. I'm thinking about picking up a strand that you mentioned earlier, uh, relevant to the master and his emissary, about how when the master had to hire emissaries, uh, circuit riders, as it were, the master had forbearance and realized that he needed to remain distant. Yeah. In other words, he really had to delegate to the emissaries, or he wouldn't have been able to hold the center. Uh, the true center of the kingdom. And that there is something here in this story, too, where our princess is forbearing of the, you know, her chambermaid says, you know, get off the horse yourself and go drink out of the stream if you want to drink. And our princess says, well, okay. And so it goes. And that what she's really hiding from Conrad, her fellow goose tender, <laughs> is her golden hair. And that's a motif in fairy tales um, that, that we've seen in Iron John and others of the golden solar special crown, her crowning glory, as it were, that is gold. And that we hide our true gold, or our true gold gets forgotten um, as the emissaries take over, or the chambermaid becomes dictatorial. That's beautiful, Deb. That one of the ways that we betray ourselves is to hide our light. And I think there's a lot of that. If I claim that, if I claim my bigness in the world, if I go for my real ambition here, and I try out for the, the lead of the play, let's say, there will be a repercussion, you know, that there will be something that's, that is shaming or punitive or whatever, because we dared to stand up and be big. Uh, we dare to be seen. I think the dream is also, in another lens, is about the way complexes can act against our own true and essential nature. Mm -hmm. And so often in fairy tales, the wicked stepmother is an aspect of the shadow of the mother. So the mother provides all of these lovely gifts and three drops of her blood, but she's also the one that says, who, hey, take this chambermaid. Mm -hmm. You know, she'll be great. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> and so, you know, the chambermaid, I think, represents the shadow of the mother, the the aspect of the mother that says, hey, I haven't you know, been married for years. My husband's dead. I think I'd like yours instead. Mm -hmm. That would like to um, take over the life of the daughter. It's a, it, an aspect of envy that is suppressed, but it is absorbed. And so we have this, this young, lovely girl who's going to a, a lovely fate, we imagine. And then the shadow of the mother shows up and starts bossing her around and just as you said, Deb, forcing her to hide in rags, so to speak, and to be silent and mm -hmm. not say anything and not stand up for herself or even to tell the truth for that matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The horse represents just the capacity to tell the truth, just to have your own voice. But the, the mother complex here just silences everything inside of the girl. It's wonderful. The king often represents or can represent the self or something that can bring order to the situation. I found the relationship between the king and the goose boy so strange. I mean, what, what <laughs> kings like go and like, have the goose boy come in and ask him for advice? So the goose boy represents some 
aspect of the king's shadow, the, the lowliest part of himself, but also gives him essential information that can relate to the girl, which then allows him to become suspicious of what's going on and to restore things to right order. So we can know who we are, we set out in life, and then all of a sudden a father complex, a mother complex, some other kind of difficulty that we had in childhood rears itself up, and it forces us to serve something other than our authentic self. Mm -hmm. We've said that in many ways across the, our conversation, but here it's an active interference by the shadow of the mother, which is as much an example as any other complex that can alienate ourselves from who we really are. What I'm thinking about here is the role of the masculine uh, in this tale. And many a tale starts off with one or the other parents is missing. And in this time, there's an old queen whose husband had been dead for many years. So the masculine has been out of the picture. Our, our princess does not have a father. An inner masculine that we can often refer to as animus, our inner other, the opposite. And the first thing that happens is our little Conrad, who's just a kid, and all he knows is how to tend geese, says, hey, wait a minute. She's got golden hair. That's really cool. I think I want some. And then he complains to the king about it. I'm not going to do this with her anymore. I don't like her. She's really difficult, etc. The other part of the masculine is the, is the king, the ruler. Uh, so these two parts connect. Uh, the king listens to the goose boy and is curious. He is interested, and he goes forth and observes under the gate and then hides behind a bush uh, so that there is a part of the personality that, that has that role as well. Of uh, First, I just, like the young boy, I just notice there's gold here and a more capable, more advanced, mature part of the psyche says, right, I'm going to look into this. Yeah, in some, in some sense, I think about um, this, this, the false bride as the one who is more adapted to external values, and therefore, uh, you know, which, which again, is a good thing, right? It's good to have a part of us that is more adapt that's adapted to external values. But it's the way that that can take over the other sort of more essential, tender, deeper part of ourselves. So there, there's lots of different ways to think about um, these fairy tales. One of the things that's hard is when you think about it like the shadow, because that's that's where you would initially go with this. But it mm -hmm. doesn't. It's it's unsatisfying to me to to say, well, the chambermaid is is the shadow. But in, in some sense, she is the shadow. She is. She is the part of the psyche that uh, that represents, um, uh, you know, it, it's not it's not the typical kind of positive shadow that we often find in fairy tales. This shadow really is negative because because it's not it's not it's not the true thing. It's the false thing. And she's the usurper. Yeah, like the emissary. And she's a good shadow figure in as much as the trip starts out and it looks one way. And then there's a secret, something that's not seen ostensibly, that suddenly reveals itself, and she is usurping and full of power drive and mm -hmm. cunning and bullying and dangerous. You know, that's you just put your finger on it, right? Is it's a power drive? It may, mm -hmm. it may, that may be what it is. Yep. It's an image of the kind of power drive in the psyche and how that can cause us to betray ourselves. You know, this particular configuration doesn't really exist in a masculine form like you, there isn't there, there are there are um there are fairy tales about the false bridegroom but they they don't look like this and i think that's really interesting joseph so something about about the the power drive that in in when it sits in a particular way in a woman's psyche it can really cause her to betray herself yeah and that kind of maps on to what you were saying earlier in the example of, you know, somebody who goes off to college mm -hmm. and that first stage of day-to-day -day lived autonomy, whatever it is, 
and how uh no i I think I will go out to the bar tonight. I think I you know I can do this. I finally have this autonomy, and nobody can tell me what what time I need to be home or or what I'm supposed to do. And that power drive often, I think, comes up as part of young adulthood, I think, of of giving in to some of that immediate gratification, eph- more ephemeral pleasures that are not aligned with our true self. And we often have to do what the goose girl did, which is, you know, go in some sort of a metaphorical iron stove mm-hmm. and have have a conversation with ourselves of like, oh my gosh, look at this. I'm spending my time in these ways. I'm not being true to myself. Yeah. And it's it's always so devastating whenever I read this uh, story that Falada is killed. I know. That feels like such an essential betrayal to to kill to kill the, the innocent animal. And something so magical and extraordinary. Yeah. To kill the magical thing. Yes, to kill the magical thing. Yeah. So we've we've covered a lot of territory with self betrayal and so many different ways of thinking about betrayal and treachery and who are we really can we lay hold of that clearly enough that we know who we are in most circumstances i think the fairy tale also talks about youth when we're young our values are there but they're often unconscious mm-hmm. because there is a matrix from with which our personality is grown so so there is an authentic stance, but it can take us decades before we can find language for what is true in us and what is true about us. Mm. And devoid of language, it's much more difficult to stay conscious of what our values are Mm. and what's real and true inside of ourselves. We have to fight for that. And so one might even think in in the fairy tale that she has to undergo some of this difficulty to, in fact, know what's important to her. Yeah, it's it is a story of a kind of clarification of of our stance, of our values, and knowledge of who we are. And she is a bit of a goose, <laughs> <laughs> but she is. I mean, yeah. The chambermaid decides to start herding her around with a stick, telling her yep. what to do: go here, go there. She's kind of a goose, and she's going to go out in the field with the other geese and. The king's like, oh, yeah, we'll crawl in a stove and just tell your secrets. And she's like a goose. She's like, oh, okay. So it lifts up the necessity of discerning what is true forbearance and what is simply compliance. Mm -hmm. Am I truly forbearing or am I just going along to get along? Suffering makes us often realize, ouch. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. This feels really terrible. I am I am not that person. Suffering brings consciousness. It does. This week's dream is from a woman who is 43 years old and she is a writer and a somatic practitioner. And here's the dream. I am congested, though I don't feel sick, other than the sensation of needing to blow my nose. I anticipate that what will come out is mucus, though not runny mucus, something ball-like and formed. I feel a tickle in my nasal cavity, but every time I try to blow, nothing comes out. Finally, I manage to get something out, but I'm immediately horrified to see it's a living creature, a prehistoric bug that is rust-colored with six legs on either side and a flat, oval-shaped body. I immediately recognize it as a troglodyte and feel disgusted. This experience continues over and over again, the feeling that there is something in my nose, difficulty getting it out, and then blowing out a troglodyte. When the troglodyte comes out, it quickly scurries away like a cockroach being exposed to the light. Each time this happens before the bug comes out, I'm sure that this time it will just be mucus. 
in the dream, there's a sense that if I blow enough, I can get to the bottom of the bugs, but this never happens. One of the bugs, I get wet with water from my faucet, though I don't know why I do this. It expands in size like a foamy mushroom bug, which horrifies me. I tell my mother about what I'm experiencing, and she says she had the same thing. I just need to get an antiviral from my doctor, and it will clear up. I'm immediately angry because she obviously gave me this ailment. She brushes off this accusation, and it appears that she can't hear me or doesn't care. Then I wake up. So for associations, she says, the night before the dream, I learned that a colleague had negotiated a salary of $130,000 for a job that I initially turned down. I have struggled with my finances for years and can't imagine this kind of stability, though I do long for it. Part of the reason I turned down the job initially was that the organization did not feel psychologically safe to me at the time. I'm a person of color, and all other people of color staff members had left the organization. The organization was making a commitment to racial justice work, but had not yet begun this process. I was the first person of color they had reached out to since the other BIPOC teachers had departed. And that means biracial indigenous people of color. Uh, She says the main feelings in the dream were, before the bug came out, it felt like I might finally be successful and clear what was in my nasal cavity for good. But then I was met with another bug. I felt disgusted and like there was something seriously wrong with me. There was also a feeling of shame. I didn't want others to know that I was filled with these cockroach-like bugs. And for additional content, she says, It's interested, interesting to me that I named the bug a troglodyte. This is not a word I commonly use. I was interested in looking up its meaning when I awoke. My mother is white and tries to empathize with my experience as a woman of color, but she doesn't always get it. I'll also say that the person who took the job I declined is a woman of color also. Okay. Do any of us know what a troglodyte actually is? Yeah, it's a hermit or someone who lives in a cave. I think etymology is it comes from a word for cave, maybe? It's uh, from the Greek, and it means one who creeps into holes. Mm -hmm. Cave dweller. So in ancient texts, it's part of the mythology of prehistoric humans. That, you know, where, where did the original humans come from? And somehow they were hole dwellers or cave dwellers. Mm. And I think it can also kind of have this, it can be used to have the sense of like someone who is kind of like um, almost willfully stupid or unsophisticated. Is that, is that right? I think that's a Luddite, but, um, but perhaps so. But I think that is the connotation, that a troglodyte is a primitive, unlearned, unsophisticated kind of person. So it has. We're in that realm of shadow, mm-hmm. something to do with something primal, mm-hmm. something coming out of the ground. So we know it's something in the unconscious. Um, if it has something to do with some kind of fantasy of ancient peoples about the original humans, it's something very instinctive, and and feels very far away. And I think when we dream of insects. We're almost always dreaming about complexes, but we're dreaming about something that is so radically alien to anything that we experience in ourselves, just like, you know, watching a praying mantis and trying to figure out what's going on inside of the praying mantis. It's, it's so, so it's different other. from us, very other. I think the fact that it's coming out of her nose is important. The nose and smell being connected to intuition. Hmm. So I found myself saying, what would it mean that there's something clogging up her intuition? Mm -hmm. She does have an instinct. She can blow it out. So she has a way of kind of clearing out the canal. She does get a glimpse of what's going on in there, and it's somehow related to the mother. So we're back in this realm of potentially the mother complex and how it 
how it acts in her own psyche, and that she's becoming aware of it. That there's a revelation, a revelatory component of the dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously Joseph. I really like that that stuff about sort of intuition and and thinking about the the bugs as a complex. And of course, bugs are like so autonomous. Also, you know, they just are going to do what they do, and they mm -hmm. don't, you know, have any relationship with us. You know, um, I also think it's really you know, th th there's such disgust and shame, you know, that she mentions. And, and I wonder if that's related to her experience of herself as a person of color, if there's, if that's part of the layering there. Um, but, but it, but also, um, one of the things that really struck me about this dream is the mom says, you just need an antiviral. The mom says, I had this too. And the dreamer kind of bats that away. But mm -hmm. but there's there's as I think you were saying you know this is something that actually comes from the mother complex, but it feels important to me that there is a remedy for it, mm -hmm. and and one of the things that I think is really significant potentially I'd love to know if, what you guys think about this is that um, I just need to get an antiviral from my doctor and it will clear up. It's like pretty simple. I'm immediately angry because she obviously gave me this ailment. So it makes me wonder about um, the dreamers, uh, let's say, I I'm going to say self-sabotaging attitude about this job, although I don't know that that's totally fair. I'm just kind of, it's a placeholder, you know, it's like, was that a self, was it self-sabotaging to turn down the job? But it's somehow, it's kind of, is it related to the fact that her mother's offering her something that would fix it? And her response is to get angry because you gave it to me. So there's, there's something, there's something about the mom says it'll go away if you get an antiviral and then I get angry and it's like that there's, are you staying, are you staying stuck in some kind of resentment when actually you just need to get the antiviral? <laughs> I don't know. I am mapping some of this onto the fairy tale of the goose girl <laughs> instead of getting the antiviral that there is some way that there is this awful ailment, you know, like being relegated to the pasture to tend the geese. Of And I'm also thinking about the possible history here with this job that pays such a very, very great deal of money. And that there, you know, there were two instances here, at least possibly, of of turning down the good thing, the job, and the antiviral, mm -hmm. and because it seems like it's much bigger than that. You know, the problem that I have if I have these bugs inside my nasal cavity is obviously much bigger than any antiviral could possibly handle. Versus, what if there is a simple solution? What if it is worth trying? Uh, that her, you know, the possible, you know, having the financial stability that she says she would really like to have was also uh, brushed aside because of the the sense of feeling isolated in the workplace as a person of color. So there's some way I feel like the there's a, a way of wanting a kind of support, a kind of empathy, a kind of resonance with how big all this is uh, that, that our dreamer and dream ego may not have had versus um, that casual, here's a simple solution attitude. I think that when we have a lot of unconscious material around a circumstance, it's difficult to relate simply to the solution because so many different voices are looking for resolution simultaneously. Exactly. So sometimes we just need to sequence it. Let's do the antibiotics now, and then after that we'll wonder, how did I get this infection? Oh, that's great. Then thirdly, right. maybe I'll examine right. what these bugs are right. and catch one. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Yeah. But solving the problem, because it could be hurtful. To her to have these parasites. Wow, that's that's really great, Joseph. I really like that. But everything, like what you said about there are these different things, and and you know, and then you can sequence it. So, like, if we are going to kind of map this onto the job, like 
just get financially stable first. And then you might be able to, to do the work and say, how did this happen? How did I get here? But what I'm thinking about relevant to what you just said, Joseph, is that maybe, you know, the feelings get minimized or brushed yes. past. And how infuriating that is. You know, I've got this terrible problem with yeah, yeah, this and that and the point. other. And somebody says, oh, well, you know, just get some WD-40 and spray it on. <laughs> and it's like, no, you're not hearing how frustrating and defeated and, and helpless I feel. And that that level of our psyches, ourselves, also needs to be understood, appreciated, and addressed. That's that feels also really right on to me, Deb. That that yes, that she that she can't focus on the solution being offered because she feels dismissed. Yes, exactly. And, and that it might be really important to just say, "But can you just you know can you just be with me and how awful this is?" Mm -hmm. And then I'll go get the prescription filled. The feelings that she notes in the dream are horror and disgust. Mm -hmm. So it would also be helpful to just really rest into those feelings. And what are the various things that are horrifying, that are difficult to get out, get into the room, get into discussion? Mm. What, what are the things that evoke disgust? Do we feel that we are held as an object of disgust in one environment or another, or were perhaps somewhere in our childhood? There's so much gentle kind of opening of things, I think, that we're all talking about, because there's so many dimensions to her suffering. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the troglodyte that scurries away when it's exposed to light is, is a really important thing that taking it a little bit out of the context, but our complexes don't like to be seen. And, and often we'll get a glimpse of something inside of ourselves that makes us uncomfortable, and then we, we can barely even remember what we just were thinking about a moment ago. Mm -hmm. But what strikes me is that in the beginning of the dream, she is determined to get this stuff out of her nose. And she keeps trying, and then nothing's coming out. And I, but she feels something tickling her mm -hmm. <laughs> inside of her nose. And we've all had that such sensation. It's like you almost can't think of anything else because it's like it's just so disconcerting. So something's tickling her awareness. Something's bugging she, her. Bugging her. <laughs> and gosh darn it, she is going to keep blowing her nose or trying to get the hidden thing out in front of her. And even once it's there, it's very complicated and shocking, and she doesn't quite know what to do with it. But I like her determination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. There's a lot in her, in her attitude that I feel like, yeah. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.